My name is Trip Gorman, and in this episode of SME VC, I sat down with Jonathan Whittle, co-founder and managing partner at Fona Capital. Fona invests in fintech innovators that are advancing inclusion across three emerging market regions. John is exclusively focused on Latin American fintech companies, and other Fona partners are specialized in Africa and the Middle East, as well as South and Southeast Asia. Jonathan is currently on the board of 13 Latin American technology companies. In this episode, we discussed how Fona leverages their insights learned from other emerging markets in Latin America. The hardest part of raising Quona Capital's $332 million Fund 3, how Jonathan's role changes on the board of technology companies, depending on if he's board observer or a board member, and Jonathan's experiences living in Sao Paulo versus Buenos Aires. We discuss all this and more in this episode of Simia VC. Okay, Jonathan, could you start by telling the audience a bit more about your work history up to and including your current role at Quona Capital? Uh, sure thing. So I actually started out uh, thinking I want to be a diplomat, uh, joined the State Department, and uh, quickly realized that working for a large organization like that wasn't wasn't for me. Uh, I was waiting for security clearance, was working for uh, the uh, head of the Latin American Studies Program, I was preparing diplomats to go to Latin America, um, and uh, decided that I should actually go back to school and and, and think about uh, uh, other options. So I went to Georgetown for uh, for grad school. And coming out of that, um, I was still interested in the policy space. Uh, I was working for a trade policy consulting firm. Uh, my boss at the time was a candidate for uh, becoming U.S. trade representative, which I thought was quite interesting. When that didn't work out, then uh, um, I was very fortunate to join a, uh, a startup in the telecom space that had been backed by a, a famed venture capital um, investor out of Silicon Valley called Arthur Rock. I was the first hire of the three founders uh, really aiming to build out uh, wireless um, communications infrastructure throughout Latin America. And that's that's really what started my, my career in uh, in Latin America, kind of on both sides of the table as uh, as part of founding management, founding management teams of a number of venture backed uh, companies. In, in Latin America and then as a VC. So with that, uh, with that first company, I ended up moving to, to Argentina where we just secured some licenses and it was use them or lose them. Um, told my wife we'd be down for six months, ended up being in, in uh, Argentina for, uh, for seven years. Uh, we, uh, with the two of the founders of that company, we left uh, three years later to start another company. Um, and then with another of those, uh, with one of the founders, we left to start a, a, a third company. Throughout, uh, really building infrastructure throughout Latin America, and then the uh, the tech 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 bubble burst, as did um, uh, Argentina, which went through a crisis. Brazil as well. So kind of have lived through uh, multiple crises. Uh, that was the first of them. Moved back to the U.S., joined a, a private equity firm to manage a venture fund for Latin America, which at the time. Um, there was really no one doing venture capital in uh, in the region except for us and uh, and Intel Capital. Um, it was very much the pioneering uh, uh, days of venture capital in Latin America. Um, after nine years of that, got the entrepreneurial itch and started a payments company in uh, in Brazil, kind of a precursor to challenger banking companies. Um, a company called Aceso that was recently acquired by a publicly traded company in uh, in Brazil was uh, CEO of that company for three years, and then was looking to get back on the on the investing side. Um, and met up with uh, my co-founder Monica Brand uh, Angle um, and the the board at uh, at Axion, which is a nonprofit focused on microfinance. It was looking to sponsor what became Quona, um, a, a a firm that's at the intersection of financial technology and financial inclusion, uh, really using technology to be able to advance um, financial inclusion across emerging markets. Which for me uh, scratched at three itches at the same time. Um, one, I really love investing at the early stage, um, and it allowed me to get back uh, to, to to doing so after having had a stint as an entrepreneur. Two, um, the company that I'd launched in Brazil was focused on bringing financial services to the end and underbanked. Um, and uh, I think bringing, bringing financial services to to those who are underserved across emerging markets uh, was something that kind of gives meaning to uh, to 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 your work. If you're going to do do work, it's it's fantastic to uh, also have uh, some some purpose that goes beyond just uh, just just uh, making money, and providing for your family. Um, and three, you know, it's a, it's an entrepreneurial venture. We were able to start something from scratch. Um, we were we were lucky to have a strong sponsor, uh, but uh, we really 
uh, spun out and were completely independent on the date of our first close of our first fund, uh, which was in 2015. Since then, we've, we've, uh, we're now investing out of our third fund. Our second fund was 2018. Third fund, we just announced the final closing of, but we've been investing out of it for about a year. Um, so we're now at about $750 million of, uh, of assets under management, uh, a team spread across the globe, um, and uh, been a fantastic ride. So that, in summary, is uh, a bit of my, my, my background over the past uh, few decades. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I'd be interested to know a little more specifically, what does Quanta Capital do differently? Sure. So when we when we started the firm, we really set out to start to uh, prove to the markets that we could deliver both um, top financial returns and measurable social impact. Uh, we believe that there's a growing universe of, uh, of investors that are really looking for a combination of the two, but they're not willing to compromise on the former. So we are a financial first impact fund. Um, we aim to be and have been uh, in the top quartile of our peers in venture capital while delivering uh, measurable social impact by choosing investments that we believe are, are, are um, kind of inherently impactful by bringing financial services to underserved consumers and small businesses um, and, and then working with them to be able to uh, measure uh, the progress there and deliver reports to our 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 uh, investors in combination with what we provide them on the financial returns. We um, uh, and I think we we really are part of that new breed of, uh, of 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 venture firms and of asset managers that are proving that you really can uh, do both. You can deliver profits with purpose, um, and you shouldn't have to compromise financial returns to be able to invest in companies that are really helping to change the world. So I think that's the key thing that is uh, that is different about us. The way that we operate is very much like uh, like our our uh, generalist uh, VC peers. Uh, we're very disciplined in the approach that we take to choosing uh, how to deploy our capital. Um, we uh, generally co-invest with uh, with other non-impact generalist VC funds, um, and I think what we bring to the market then is is unique in in that um, we've been able to combine the two. The other thing that makes us unique is that we are a truly global platform, um, but we're deeply uh, embedded in and part of the local ecosystem of the of the countries that we invest in. So we uh, we have team members uh, across. Uh, South, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, uh, and uh, and the Middle East. Um, again, very much a part of our of, of the ecosystems in which we, which we invest. I, I shared with you a bit of my three decade track record uh, or experience in uh, in Latin America. I've been part of the VC ecosystem since that since the very beginning, and that's a similar story for my 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 colleagues. But what we've really worked at is to have that combination of deep local ties and insight. Uh, with a global platform wherein we operate as a as a as a single team, we make investments together. We have a single strategy. We invest out of a single fund, and we really look to uh, draw out the strengths of a a platform that has perspective and visibility into innovation uh, that's happening across the globe. And a lot of that innovation is happening in emerging markets to inform our investment decisions and to then bring value to our portfolio companies and co-investors by kind of connecting the dots, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of learning to be had by by leveraging a lot of these relationships that we have across the globe. So I'd say, you know, those are the kind of the key things that make us a little different than uh, than, than other VC firms uh, in 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 emerging markets and certainly in the, in the U.S. I love it. And one of your biggest themes is financial inclusion, and I know you've discussed it in brief during our one of some of your previous answers. But what does the term financial inclusion mean for you and Quona? Yeah, so it's, it's actually fairly simple, right? It's really about expanding access to financial services for underserved uh, consumers and small businesses. But it's really a, 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 it comes from a fundamental belief that financial services is what you know makes economies work. It's what allows uh, individuals to be able to pursue their dreams, protect their families, um, to reach their full potential. Uh, it's what allows small businesses to be able to thrive, uh, and it's what ultimately allows uh, the societies and countries in emerging markets to be able to prosper. Um, without financial services, you know, not 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 much happens, right? Uh, and so, um, we we believe it's a real catalyst for 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 change in all of our markets. Um, the way that we approach impact uh, or, or financial inclusion is with a a, a three pillar framework, which is about access, quality, and markets. So, access is you know pretty clear cut. It's about expanding access to financial services. Quality is about 
backing companies that are providing services that are doing good, not harm. And that's that's the case for most companies, but really there are some that uh, that we shy away from because we don't we don't think that they are are, are providing uh, individuals and businesses with the kinds of services that are going to make their lives better. Um, and then third, it's about markets, and that's uh, that that markets um, has a, a number of different uh, ways to be to be viewed. Um, one is kind of what we're bringing as a firm, which is demonstrating that we can deliver um, uh, top financial returns and measurable. Uh, 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 measurable social impact in order to bring more capital to this to this asset class uh, and to make to kind of unlock if you will uh, the billions and billions of dollars that is available from asset managers looking for that combination but at the individual company level it's really about backing companies that uh, are demonstrating to the markets that certain strategies certain segments certain strategies will work that certain segments can be served at scale and profitably in order to bring uh, more entrance into those uh into those uh markets and uh and and uh have impact beyond the impact just of the company that we're backing we have multiple examples of that but it's really about shaping markets demonstrating to markets that certain strategies um can um can deliver fantastic financial returns which is what's going to attract more capital and have more and more impact at scale Speaking about attracting more capital, you just publicly announced that $332 million Quanta Capital Fund 3. What was the hardest part about raising this fund? First, congratulations. And then how will this fund deployment differ from past funds? So in many respects, <laughs> this, you know, this, this fundraising uh, was easier than it was in our first two funds, in part because we've been able to demonstrate um, that we can deliver in our promise. Uh, I think our track record speaks for itself. Uh, it's, been, it's been quite good. Um, and we also have a, a, um, a, a fantastic group of investors, uh, many of which have backed us in funds one, two, and three. So a lot of re-ups. We were able to bring in quite a few new investors. And in part, that's because we started fundraising when the market was, was uh, doing very well. We started fundraising in 2021. Challenges, obviously, in 2022, as the market changed, uh, was... Um, uh, was was you know raising raising capital in much more um, uh, fraught times. Fortunately, though, uh, we also are seeing that there is uh, truly a growing universe of investors that is feeling uh, pressure from their own constituency, uh, from 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 their investors, uh, to uh, look for platforms like ours that are delivering both financial returns and measurable. Um, uh, social impact. So in many respects, I think we're beginning to see the fruit of the work that we've done over the last uh, eight years. Um, as many asset managers were telling us, we would love to have product like this, but we just can't find it. There's a lot of interest from our uh, constituency for products like this, but we can't find them at scale. And we're beginning to, together with a few others in the market, be able to demonstrate that. So I, I would say it was it was not easy. Um, I, certainly, as we moved into 2022, but I think we're in a we're in a good spot as a uh, as a firm um, to be able to tap into this this uh, growing interest in in what we're doing. Uh, so I, I I would love to say it was extraordinarily difficult, <laughs> but uh, compared to raising the first fund, uh, you know, when you're a first time manager out there, uh, really selling the promise uh, to where we are now, it's gotten a little easier. So you talked a little bit about this team that's distributed across the world that you said is has uh, two funds worth of uh, results that are very positive. Could you talk about the geographical distribution of Quona's team across the world? And how does Quona's capital's thesis and strategies differ between Latin America, Asia, Africa, and different parts of the global south? Sure. So our, our Asian team is based in Bangalore and Jakarta. Uh, two of my partners are based in Bangalore. Uh, a, uh, another partner is based in Jakarta. Uh, in Latin America, I, I spend uh, about half my time in 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 Brazil. I have a team member in Brazil, uh, and one of my partners is based in Mexico City. Um, and then in Africa, uh, I have a partner based in in Cape Town, and then team members in Nairobi, Lagos, uh, and then another who splits his time between Dubai and uh, and Cairo. Then our back office is uh, is is in is in the U.S. and uh, two of us co-founders, myself and Monica Brand Engel, are based in in the U.S. but uh, but travel frequently. So actually, of our investment team of of uh, I guess we're fourteen now. Uh, only two of us are based in the U.S. Everyone else is is uh, is in our markets. Um, 
I think, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, what makes us unique is that we operate as a single team. Uh, we make investment decisions together. We spend a, a lot of effort uh, and, and resources in, in ensuring that we are able to really coordinate um, and spend time together, um, ideate together and make decisions together. Um, and really draw from the the strengths of perspective across markets that are different. Um, and there are a lot of similarities, but there are different speeds at which development has occurred in, uh, in, in our markets, which is then leading to different types of innovation, different, different types of opportunities. So we invest across company, uh, countries that are uh, middle market uh, with uh, very solid financial infrastructure, companies like Brazil, um, still with huge unmet needs and very large uh, unbanked um, uh, uh, populations. And then we have uh, markets, say in Africa, where um, uh, they're much earlier in the development curve, uh, and there's a lot of leapfrogging happening. So we are seeing uh, differences, uh, I would say, principally around um, how long they've been middle income countries and the sophistication of the financial um, and, and regulatory system um, uh, that is creating, again, different types of opportunities. The cool thing is that many of our countries are the, the countries that we invest in are kind of advancing toward the same ends, the same goals at different speeds. And so there's knowledge to be shared, not just um, at the at the company thesis um, uh, level, uh, but also at the at the regulatory level um, and uh, um, in, in in with respect to kind of general framework for creating then kind of next level of, of, of innovation and opportunity across our, our, our markets. But definitely there's a there's there's a difference in the types of opportunities we're seeing, say, out of India or Brazil versus what we might be seeing out of uh, Kenya, uh, uh, Nigeria or uh, or Egypt. All fascinating, all hugely scalable, uh, but uh, but a bit different. And that, again, is is the, the strength of of the platform that we built is to be able to see all of this, not just see it, but be involved in engaged in it. Uh, and to be able to share those experiences across the uh, across the platform, and with our entrepreneurs to uh, to really bring value, open their eyes to what's possible, um, and uh, and 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 hopefully foment even more creativity than we'd be able to foment if we were just focused on a single region. I love that taking lessons from different parts of the global south and then leveraging that. I, that that's very interesting. I want to switch to a fun question: What is your favorite investment, and why? <laughs> so it's like asking, you know, what's your favorite child? Uh, so uh, love, love all of our investments, and and really just, you know, I think what I what I get a charge of is being able to engage with and interact with uh, entrepreneurs doing uh, amazing, uh, but but hard things and doing it with a, with with a lot of passion and excitement. But I'll, I'll talk about one that I think kind of fits our our thesis well. Um, it's a company called Creditas out of uh, out of Brazil. It's the uh, largest secured lender in Brazil, focused on home equity, auto equity, auto finance, payroll loans in uh, in Brazil, really bringing uh, the benefits of secured lending to um, to the the, um, uh, the 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 mass market in uh, in Brazil. And where they where they started out was was really um, with a, a a a fundamental belief that something needed to change in Brazil. So Brazil has some of the highest interest rates in the world. Uh, bank um, fees and uh, and costs are extraordinarily high. Ninety percent of banking assets, until just recently, uh, were uh, were in the hands of uh, of five banks. Um, huge concentration, and again, amongst the highest interest rates in uh, in in the world. I mean, when I say high, I mean four hundred percent interest rate for credit cards, uh, over one hundred percent interest rates for a uh, for a personal loan. And, you know, you just go on and on. It's just, you know, extraordinarily high. <clears throat> Home equity loans were available only for uh, the the very upper income segments through their private banking relationships, a very paper-based uh, manual process. And that was the first market that that, that Creditas attacked. And the, the idea here was we're going to allow the uh, roughly 75% of Brazilians who own their homes outright to be able to leverage that asset to be able to get a much, much lower cost uh, loan. And when I when I say much lower cost, um, uh, it's been uh, sub 20% uh, 15-year loans uh, for 
uh, a market that you know has been accustomed to very short-term, super high interest loans. So for them, it's absolutely transformative that can be invested into businesses, uh, uh, into education, into home improvements, whatever it is that they that they uh, that they desire or to refinance uh, you know high interest unsecured loans. They've since moved from that into uh, auto equity loans, auto finance, payroll loans, where the uh, the regulatory environment in, in Brazil is very good for payroll loans, very protective of the consumer, uh, very protective also of the, uh, of the lender. Uh, but it was really only available in, in the early stages to public employees, and nobody had really feel, figured out how to offer this to small and mid-sized companies at scale to be able to allow them to provide uh, payroll lending. So... So for us, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a fantastic thesis. And where are we now after having invested in the uh, in the company Series A back in 2015, when the company basically had no no revenues? It's now a, a over 3,000 employee uh, company. Um, the last uh, the last um, equity round was raised at almost a five billion dollar uh, valuation. Uh, it's been able to attract about a billion dollars in uh, in financing. Um, is now one of the largest players in secured uh, lending in in Brazil, and the cool thing is, it's now attracted a lot of other entrants who have seen that that uh, this middle mass market can be served at scale with technology and process, bringing the benefits of uh, of secured lending to them. And so it's now expanded the entire category. So you think about again our our impact framework of access they've expanded access to this financial services to underserved segments that previously didn't have access to this type of of uh, secured lending quality because it's a truly quality product if you, if you compare it to uh, unsecured consumer loans you know, at extraordinarily high interest rates and then markets in that they've impacted markets and have expanded the entire market um they they are the market leader which we're very happy about uh but it's a market that is uh, has expanded by leaps and bounds as incumbent banks and as new entrants have uh, have recognized that there's a huge opportunity here and uh, and have pushed in. So that's one that um, I think, you know, kind of uh, encapsulates our thesis uh, uh, really well, financial return and measurable financial impact at scale. What a phenomenal story. And I'm glad you didn't stop at the PR answer at the beginning of none were your favorites. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I want to now talk about you know invest, investing your time as someone who's living in a city and you lived in Buenos Aires and you've lived in Sao Paulo. How do you compare living in these different cities or the differences and and um, you know how did you juxtapose some of the many similarities and some of the many differences? I, I have a real soft spot spot uh, soft spot in my heart for uh, Buenos Aires. Um, we lived there when our kids were little. I had two kids who were, who were born in uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, Argentines are incredibly warm and welcoming. Some of our uh, our best friends, even now, after having moved away from Argentina in 2002, are, are Argentine. We remain in very close contact with them. Want Argentina to win the World Cup. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, it's it's just a delightful city. Buenos Aires is. It's uh, it's very European. Um, uh, you feel very very comfortable there. The cuisine is amazing. Uh, the people are fantastic. Um, it's a challenging place to do business, right? Uh, uh, and that 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 is it's uh, it's the the, uh, the 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 negative side of uh, of Argentina is just how challenging politics uh, and business has been over the last twenty years. We were there during a, a period of a lot of hope and expectation in uh, in in Argentina in the uh, in the late nineties. Uh, things have changed and become much more challenging. They remain challenging, but it's still yeah, just an incredible place to visit. <laughs> I love Argent Argentine culture and. Uh, um, and our, our friends there are extraordinarily dear. I think um, Sao Paulo is you know, a, a very different city. Sao Paulo is um, is is uh, uh, huge, a little overwhelming um, uh, initially. Uh, it's a you know massive concrete jungle. What it what it has though is a a a, a just a pulsating energy. Um, I find the the business community there to be uh, uh, um, you know, incredibly vibrant and. Uh, fun to be engaged in that and involved with. I think the uh, the, the rules of play in uh, in Brazil uh, are complicated, but they're the same rules of play for everyone, and they're fairly predictable. Whereas Argentina has been very unpredictable over the last twenty years, uh, Brazil is predictably complicated. Uh, but that means you know you you can figure it out. It's not by it's not who you know. It's really about uh, about uh, about effort and, uh, and 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 putting the 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 time into building an amazing team and. And uh, and navigating 
uh, waters that are complicated for everyone, uh, right? But um, but it's a, a a market that had the privilege of being uh, engaged and involved with for the last 20 years or so. And I've just seen over the last 15 in particular, the development of an incredibly deep, um, vibrant and healthy venture ecosystem uh, with a number of very successful venture funds, um, uh, kind of across the whole spectrum from early stage to late stage, um, a, 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 uh, a raft of of entrepreneurs who've built incredibly successful companies now a a second generation of of uh, entrepreneurs who cut their teeth in some of those early startups but you you really st if you go to 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 sao paulo um uh, you can you just come away with an incredible sense of 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 optimism and of uh, of of energy um the cuisine is amazing if you love japanese food you know probably some of the best japanese food in the world i think people don't know that uh, Sao Paulo has the largest Japanese community outside of uh, of of, uh, of of Japan is uh, is in is in Brazil. Um, so I do love I love that part of the cuisine, but I just find uh, being there to be uh, uh, kind of uh, gives me a lot of gives me a lot of energy. Uh, so very different from 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 uh, you know um, uh, from Buenos Aires, um, very different living experience. Um, but from a business perspective, uh, you know, ex extraordinarily exciting um, to, to, to be a part of, uh, of the milieu there in, uh, in Sao Paulo. I love that. What are you most excited about right now? So, I mean, in, in general, I think I'm, I'm most excited about um, the potential of technology to transform economies in, in emerging markets. We're really beginning to see the fruits of that. <clears throat> Um, I think financial services uh, are still very much in the early stages of being transformed by technology. But I think what I'm what I'm excited about is how the the markets in general are recognizing that um, uh, financial technology really has the potential to um, bring bring change to markets that have been extraordinarily concentrated, um, where costs have been extraordinarily high, where returns have been absurd. So bank return on assets in Africa um, are many multiples of what they are in Europe and the US, many multiples. In, in Brazil and the rest of Latin America, it's been um, two to three times higher than, uh, than in the US for decades. So incredible, incredible profit pools um, that uh, have been very concentrated, and we're now beginning to see the kind of the fruit of investment in uh, in financial technology um, that um, is is beginning to change that equation. Um, so what I'm excited about is is kind of the the future. So there's a lot of foundation that has been laid by the kind of the first generation of financial technology companies upon which new innovation is being created. Uh, banking as a service. Um, uh, uh, companies that have emerged to be able to allow new companies to offer financial services without building out infrastructure themselves, creating a lot of a lot of innovation. So we're just seeing now an, an explosion of innovation mm -hmm. around a lot of the groundwork that was set over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I would mention the embracing of financial technology as a means of, of promoting financial inclusion by uh, by the regulators, by the central banks. And we're seeing this now across all of the regions that we invest in at different speeds, uh, but the creation now of regulatory frameworks that are allowing new entrants to uh, to launch and to thrive, which again is is creating this, this virtuous uh, uh, cycle um, that I think we're just at the beginning of. Um, and I don't wanna overhype this, but we're just seeing you know incredible uh, opportunity um, because of this confluence of, 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 of factors that makes me very optimistic about uh, about the future, so that's pretty general kind of uh, kind of uh, 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 of answer to your question. But then again, as a VC, you have to be open to all kinds of opportunities. So I don't want to get into specific sectors that excite me most. I'm most excited about kind of the trends um, and the opening up of, of 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 innovation in ways that I'm sure will surprise us. Um, but um, uh, that kind of innovation is being fueled by a lot of what's been been done over the last say ten years. Um, on the on, on the uh, innovator front and on the regulatory front, you're certainly right. That question was intended to elicit a, a very general, broad answer. I want to know something a little more granular. 
So a, a lot of people see, you know, VCs take on board positions, board member, board observer. And I want to ask kind of an unconventional question. So what, what do you see your role as, as someone who's on the board of a, a high growth technology startup in Latin America? And how does your role change if you're a board observer or a board member, besides obviously the lack of voting power? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so we're, 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 we're not operators. We're there to, to back our, uh, our, our entrepreneurs uh, and help them to be able to scale um, their, their companies um, and provide them with, with strategic uh, advice and guidance uh, as they go through the various stages of, uh, of, of development from the very early stages of figuring out how to build a team and properly motivate and incentivize them and build a, you know, an amazing culture uh, to eventually tapping into um, downstream capital to be able to grow and scale their company, thinking about uh, how to and whether to expand into new new markets, uh, launch new products, et cetera, but really providing um, a being a, a, a sounding board, um, providing them with uh, with advice when and as needed, um, but but knowing knowing what the limits are of uh, of of where to uh, where to lean in um, and where to provide uh, support. And and where to let the team uh, do what the team knows best because um, they know the business a lot better than we do. Um, so I think that the most the, the most effective uh, board members that I've seen um, and uh, are are those that 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 provide that that uh, that kind of uh, that perspective uh, and, uh, and and guidance uh, without getting uh, too involved. Interestingly. As a board observer, nothing really changes. Um, so most of the boards that I participate in are very, very we make decisions by consensus. There really is a, um, a uh, it's important for the, the founders to be able to tap into the collective uh, wisdom, if you will, of, uh, of, of those sitting around the table. And whether you're a board member or a board observer doesn't really matter because it's very relationship-based. Um, what changes is that a board observer doesn't have a vote. Uh, but but otherwise, if you view this as a as a a, a relationship, um, uh, then there's there's relatively little difference between uh, between the two. In some cases, we've come into a company as observers. We generally are board members. We're generally leading or co-leading our investment. But there've been a few cases where we where we come in as board observers and not as voting members. In other cases, we kind of step back as the uh, company grows, matures. As the board becomes a little large and unwieldy for voting purposes, um, uh, some of us who are there early will step back into an observer role. But in terms of the day-to-day -day engagement with uh, with the entrepreneurs, not much changes um, uh, because by that point you really have developed a uh, a, a a relationship uh, and a dynamic that goes beyond whether you have a, a voting say um, or uh, are merely a shareholder with. Uh, with an observer's uh, position, where you're kind of uh, being able to um, be part of the of the of the story and see how things are developing, so that you can weigh in and opine um, and and provide uh, support uh, as needed. But um, uh, yeah, I, 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 some of our some of the best relationships actually are board observer relationships and and not uh, not 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 board member relationships. I appreciate that context. Okay, so finally, I'm going to go into our final question. I have to ask Peter Thiel's famous contrarian question with uniquely Samia VC twist. What important truth about Latin America do very few people agree with you on? Well, I, I think um, I'll, I'll tell a truth that, that, that the insiders probably are feeling greater and greater conviction around, which is that uh, uh, Latin America is producing world-class companies and world-class leaders. And I think we're, we're we're going to see more and more of them on the uh, on the global stage. Um, these are these are companies that are born uh, born in adversity, born in difficult uh, difficult <clears throat> environments. There's a lot of re resiliency, um, but you have talent that is now beginning to have more and more confidence about um, expanding beyond Latin America uh, and onto the global stage. So I, I I would say, and I would predict that we're going to see more and more companies coming out of Latin America that are going to surprise the world. Um, these are companies that start out focused on a single single market, generally then expand throughout Latin America, um, are, are born then with uh, internationalization as part of their DNA. Uh, and that next, next hop and leap to the global stage is one that we're going to see more and more. So uh, 
those those that those of us that are doing venture in Latin America uh, are, are increasingly convinced of that. We hope to convince the world. Yeah. What an excellent answer, Jonathan. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the SME VC podcast today. I very much appreciate your time. Thanks, Trip. My pleasure. Thank you for watching this episode of SME VC. My name is Trip Gorman. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you view the podcast. And don't forget to check out our newsletter, DealFlow LA, which can be found by going to dealflow.la.